Let's do this. So, without you seeing it, I apologize for the delay, uh, the operating system of the day, we've actually reached the time where we can talk about Unix. And uh, Unix actually goes back to 1969. The, Exact release date, I find a lot of variation. Uh, Unix was originally Unix with a C, because Unix was actually developed by a bunch of the ex Multics guys, and Multics being M U L T I C S, Unix was U N I C S. And yes, Unix was named due to Multics. Multics was meant to be multiplexed complex. Unix is uniplexed simple. Um, and the gentlemen who are behind Unix uh, from Multics are Kernigan and Ritchie. And if you've heard of K and R in that sense, you may have heard of K and RC. Uh, word of warning. If you are out in the CS club or any place where you find a, a book about how to program in C, and it says across the top, K and RC, put the book down and walk away. Please. Uh, K and RC, you know how there's different standards of C. There's ANSI C, there's C99, and so on and so forth. K and R is a very old one of these standards. And if you really want to have your mind in flow, go look it up, and you will see some of the most bizarre C syntax you've ever seen in your life. I've had the misfortune of using it. It is mostly not supported anymore, although you certainly can turn support on for it. Please don't because you will confuse the shit out of everybody if you use KNRC, just avoid it. Uh, all right, so these gentlemen, KNR, they wanted to create Unix because Multics was too heavy, it was too complex. Uh, they wanted a smaller operating system that was more portable, and they were working at Bell Labs at the time. So Bell Labs is one of two major computing research labs in the world, uh, and they are the people behind Unix. Now, what did Unix have? So number one, Unix is a portable operating system. That means it was not designed to be run on one or another particular mainframe, which is very different from any of the operating systems we've seen so far. The previous operating systems were created to be run on a very specific mainframe. OS 360 runs on System 360 and so on. So Unix was designed to be portable. Uh, it was time-sharing, multi-user system, so they wanted to give everybody the illusion that they were the only user, even though there were you know, 100 connected to the machine at once. They treated everything as files. So devices were treated as files. Memory is treated as files. Inter-process communication treated as a file. And that's something we still do today if you're using a Unix or Linux-based operating system. If you want to send a message from your computer to the serial port, you write the file or pipe the output to dev tty1, and that will push the file from your whatever into the serial port. Done by file communication. It's great. It's super useful. Uh, we also have with Unix hierarchical file systems, which were not necessarily new. That's the concept of directories and so on. Another thing for Unix is the concept of plain text data storage. And um, that just means we're not using a proprietary binary format to store our data, which is great. That helps make it portable. Uh, and then the other things that Unix brought forth, which are very notable, and I mean, we'd be here forever if we listed them all, uh, but something that you probably have some experience using is the ability to pipe programs together. So it used to be, if you wanted to create a specific program to search for a process, uh, you had to write the whole program to find all the processes in the system and then have you know, an option to search for a particular thing in it. And it's one unique program. And with Unix, they were like, you know, these different tasks, searching for a process, well, that's listing all of the processes and then searching from those results. So why don't we let you split them into separate programs and let you pipe the output of one program as the input of the next? And that idea of having smaller programs that we can pipe their inputs and outputs into each other, that actually comes from Unix. And I know that you can't, in this room, see the uh, diagram that I have, but uh, I, it'll be in the stream, right? 
<laughs> uh, so if we were to look at how Unix has played a role in operating systems of today, so you've got Unix going back to about 1969, and then all of the operating systems that have either forked off of it or been influenced by it, well, BSD. And from BSD came Solaris. And from BSD came, how many of you have a Mac in this room? Yeah, you can thank Unix for that because Mac OS X is based on a BSD distribution. It's actually the chain to Mac OS goes uh, Unix to BSD to next step to Mac OS X server to Mac OS X. That's the path that we take. Then there are other Unix uh, distributions that aren't actually stemming from BSD. BSD spawned a lot of them. Uh, there's AIX, there's IRIX, there's HPUX, which is Hewlett Packard's version of Unix. Now, you might be expecting Linux to be a part of this tree. It is not direct descendant of Unix but it is almost a sister operating system in the sense that they share a lot of tools and behaviors in common, though they are technically two distinct operating systems. And the same is true for Minix, which is also a Unix-like operating system. And in this mix, there's also OSs that we haven't mentioned, like QNX, they are all Unix-like OSs. So Unix has had a huge impact on everything we pretty much do today. All right, so this is how it's gonna go. Uh, I'm going to respectfully ask that uh, you don't watch the stream in this room uh, so that you're not eating up edgy roam because that's all we've got right now. Uh, the recording of this will be made available so that you can see it with the slides. Unfortunately, we don't have access to the slides because the podium doesn't work. Uh, and I guess that's the entire campus. So we'll still go through the slides, and I will try to tell you, uh, so you can follow along with the slides on your own computer, what slides we are looking at. Uh, other than that, um, a couple regular announcements. Don't forget that you have a quiz on Friday. And another thing I want you to remember is that now that assignment one is over, it's time to start thinking about assignment A to A. And you should have everything you need to do A to A at the end of today. And I believe A to A isn't even due for like, is it like the end of the month? <laughs> Pretty close to the end of the month? You've got a lot of time. Um, you're going to be very tempted to leave it till two or three days before the deadline for A to A to do it. Please don't do that. A to A, is quite possibly the hardest assignment to debug in this whole course. Um, don't believe it. You will spend one evening writing the code and three weeks trying to figure out exactly where your recognition or your deadlock is coming from. So don't believe it. Now, on that note, uh, we go over how to do all of the assignments in class. And there are formal slides uh, that are available, and I haven't posted them to Piazza yet, but I will later today. And we will go over how to do assignment A to A next class. So on Tuesday's class, we will actually walk you through how to implement assignment A to A. Are we telling you all the answers? No, but we are giving you a guide so that you don't sit there and go, I, I don't even know where to get started. Um, it'll help you through that. All right, so on that note, we left off talking about processes. Uh, ooh, the network just came back up. Sorry, I shouldn't get excited about crazy things. I'll take a minute for the projector to boot. Uh, we were talking for uh, last week, last class, about processes and how a process isn't necessarily the program, but it's the whole execution environment that's created by the operating system for the program to run in. And so a process contains things like the address space for the program. It contains an array of all of the program's threads. And it also contains things like an open file table and access to various devices and so on and so forth. 
Uh, now, there are many different function calls we can use to manage processes and to create them. But in OS 161, there are only five that we actually care about. So in OS 161, we have four which we use to create a new process. And remember that when we create a new process, it is an identical clone of the parent, the one that forked it. Now, yes, it has its own process structure. And yes, it has its own PID. But the contents of the address space are the same. The only true difference between the two processes is that when fork returns in the child, fork returns zero, and when fork returns in the parent, it returns the PID of the child. And that's to help us identify which one is the parent and which one is the child. Uh, now, why do they both return from fork? Because the address spaces of the two processes are identical, which means the stacks of the threads are identical, which means the program counter for both processes is identical, which means even though the new process has never executed a single thing, it has all the contents as if it had been running, and its program counter is set to the same position as its parent. The other thing to remember is that when you call fork, we like to keep track of parent-child relationships. Threads did not care about each other. They had no relationships. Processes do. For every process has to have some form of a parent. All right, the other functions that we have are uh, exec fee. An exec fee does not create a new process. Yes? So you said that the uh, functional return zero is a child uh, with a PID uh, of the child as a parent. Can the PID ever be zero? No. You should never have a zero PID because then we wouldn't be able to differentiate on um, in the process. We wouldn't know which one is the parent and which one is the child. All right, let's bring processes back up here. So then we have exec v. And uh, exec v is not going to create a new process. It's going to take the existing process and it's going to change what program the existing process is running. So if the process was running hello world and you say exec v matlab, that process is now running matlab. What that means is we have to destroy the old address space, the old thread array, create a new thread array, add a new address space, and load matlab into that address space. But the process structure remains the same, and the PID remains the same, and the parent-child relationship remains the same. You had a question. Um, you said that the address spaces are identical. What if uh, two of the globals are If can one process modify the globals and will that affect the other So the question is about can one process modify the globals of another process in the address space? No. The address spaces are separate. They're two separate address spaces, but their contents are identical. And one process is not aware of where the other process's address space is. So if you make some changes to your globals or key, it does not impact the other process. Yes? So does it also make a copy of the code section and the yes. constants? Yes. Everything. It is a complete copy. All right, so we've got fork to create the process, exec v to change the program that the process is running. Then we have get PID, which will return the PID of the current running process. And we have exit in order to terminate the calling process. Now, when we call exit, it's not so simple as just terminating the process. We actually want this process, if it has a living parent, we want to leave the terminating process's death note, i.e. the parameter we pass to exit, behind. So we can terminate the process, but we are going to leave behind in the operating system some information that indicates why did this process die? What was its exit status and its exit code? But you only do that if the process's parent is alive. Yes? Yes, so in fork, 
the program counter for both processes will be pointing at the same instruction. So the trial process, when it starts executing, will start executing from the program counter position that was given to it by its parent. But the, ch uh, the children still have the code, I mean, before the form. Oh yes, they still have it. They have everything. They just are going to execute from a specific position. All right. So exit leaves behind, terminates the process, and if you have a living parent, then we're going to leave a message behind about why we were terminated and whatever note we had passed along to exit. And this works hand in hand with wait PID. What wait PID lets us do is have synchronization between two processes. So what we can do is we can force the caller to wait for a specific process to terminate. And when they terminate, we can retrieve that exit status and that exit code so that we can learn about how did this process die and did they leave behind any result for us. Now, the rules with wait PID are quite simple. You can only call wait PID on your children. Parents only care about their children. Children do not care about their parents, so you cannot call wait PID on your parents. You just can't do it. If your parent died, they were old. The answer was obvious. Uh, whereas if a child dies, the answer is not so obvious, so we obviously care. You cannot call wait PID on a sibling or a grandchild. You can only call it on your immediate children. However, there is no requirement that you call wait PID on your children. Uh, your program may not need to have the parent wait for the child to terminate. So it is not something you must do. It is just something that you could do if you want you to. Uh, now, a couple notes. Uh, we generally speaking like to reuse our process ID numbers because there's a fixed number of those available. You need to be careful about when can you and can you not reuse those process ID numbers and when can you truly delete all the information about an existing process. Now I'm going to leave that as a thinking exercise for today and on Tuesday when we talk about implementing A2A then we will go into a little bit greater detail but just keep it in the back of your head uh, as something to think about. All right now what we're going to do is continue then talking about these things but let's look at their implementation. So first off, I've been calling fork exec B get PID. I have been calling them process management calls. But that's not entirely accurate. What they are actually is known as system calls. And there are more system calls than just those related to processes. Uh, there are things like opening and closing a file, reading and writing from a file, creating directories, shutting the computer down, adjusting the voltage of the CPU. If you don't know why you would do that, you're lucky. <laughs> so there are many different kinds of system calls. What a system call is, is something, it's a function, that we are using to ask the operating system to do something for us. Remember, the job of an operating system, one of its goals is to abstract how different features are implemented and to abstract the hardware from the user program. And we do that for both security, but we also do that abstraction because that's good design. And when I want to change the hardware in my computer or when I want to update my operating system or a driver, I don't want to have to get a new user program. What I want is to be able to make those updates and have my user programs go on as if nothing happened. And part of that abstract design is letting the operating system do things like opening and closing files and reading and writing them for us. And as a result, we have many, many different system calls. And this is just a tiny list of them all. There are hundreds. All right. So, how does it work? When we want to say we're on the internet and we're like, yeah, I heard Star Wars is coming out in December. I wonder if someone's leaked it. So you go on BitTorrent, you found a leaked copy. 
be like, yeah, I'm going to download it. Okay, what has to happen? So your BitTorrent program, maybe you're a lead share and you like to use MicroTorrents, so you open up MicroTorrents, you open the torrent file in it, and it's going to save something to your computer. So you've got to save. That means you need to write to the disk. So your application MicroTorrents is going to try to open a file that is a new file. And that open function is actually a, a high-level library known as the system call library. And that is what is provided to the user applications as an interface to what the operating system can do for you. The system call library then is going to, by some mechanism, call the appropriate function inside the kernel. The kernel will then do the task that you have asked it to and return an answer to the system call library who returns the answer then to you, your user application. But you'll note in this diagram that we have this funny dashed line here that separates the system call library and application from the kernel. And that is because we have this concept of modes of privilege. User applications are unprivileged code. There are certain things that unprivileged code should not be allowed to do. Unprivileged code should not be allowed to do things like halt the CPU without permission. Because then, while you're doing some important calculation, or maybe you are writing a file to disk, we could just like pull the plug on it. And that would really screw the computer up. And likewise, the user shouldn't just directly be able to alter the voltage of the CPU. What does that do, by the way? Scales back how fast it goes. If you have overheating issues, look into that. So we shouldn't be allowed to do things like that. Other things, we shouldn't be allowed to play around with memory on our own. So we live in what's known as unprivileged land. And the kernel, who should be allowed to touch and see and do everything, lives in privileged land. Now, is this just some fancy um, comment-based description? No. This is actually uh, hardware. Your CPU has different modes. It has a privileged mode, and it also has an unprivileged mode. And when the user application is executing unprivileged code, we are in unprivileged mode on the CPU. And if while we are in unprivileged mode, my user program tries to execute a privileged instruction, the CPU will throw an exception to stop the user program from trying to do it. Likewise, if we are in kernel, land and we are executing with kernel privilege or privilege execution on the CPU, that is an actual designation on your CPU and then we can do anything we want. So that's kind of interesting. Um, here's our problem. I want my user program, which lives in unprivileged mode, to call a kernel function to open a file. Kernel code lives in privileged mode. So I need to be able to switch the CPU's mode from unprivileged to privileged mode so that I can execute the kernel's code. But why am I even letting the user call kernel functions? I should not actually let my user applications call kernel functions directly. Because if they can call the kernel function directly, then I, they presumably also need to know something about the kernel's data structures. And if my user program can do those things and know those things about the operating system, then we haven't really separated the user program from the kernel at all. And that's not good for security, obviously, unless you're a hacker. Um, and uh, the other problem, of course, is if now I change something about my operating system's data structures, well, my user program is now going to be impacting. So to truly abstract the user side from the kernel side, user programs can not call kernel functions. And the system call library cannot call kernel functions. Nor can they access kernel data structures. There is a strict 
separation between these two things. The user land, the system co-library that lives in user land, doesn't even know what the functions are called. Does not know what the data structures are, and it never needs to know them. So now you have a problem, of course. If I want to open a file, and opening a file has to be done by the kernel, how the hell do I actually make this happen? Because I, in the user land, can't actually call a function in the kernel. I don't even know what they are. Seems kind of weird, doesn't it? And yet it's a really, really good idea. Because now my user programs are totally isolated from the kernel's implementation. All right. So what's going to happen, and how do we actually get it so that my user program can actually open the file, which is something that I need the kernel to do for me? Well, how do you make any code run in the kernel? You raise an interrupt or an exception. And when you raise interrupts or exceptions, they happen at the CPU, and you want to know what magic thing happens when you do that? When the CPU receives an interrupt or exception, your program stops executing code, and the exception handler is called, which is part of the kernel code. And one other very magical thing happens. When that CPU receives the interrupt or exception, the CPU switches from unprivileged mode to privileged mode. So now we can execute our kernel's code. Now, this actually raises an interesting point. I'm going to go back here because there's a little bit of text about this on the bottom of the slide. So how many of you have heard of Meltdown or Spectre? Ready for people. I will post the papers for these particular vulnerabilities that came up about a year or two ago. Um, and if you're a little intimidated by reading you know, a research paper, don't be. They're actually very, very good reads. They're very approachable. But what Meltdown specifically was is uh, your CPU, as we've mentioned before, likes to reorder instructions to improve performance. And part of that is it may actually do some of those rearranged instructions that belong to a different privilege store the results in the cache, and then when we finally make the switch, when we finally try to use that, then we check the privilege mode, and then either validate or invalidate the thing we already did and stuck in the cache. And here's the problem with Meltdown. This is a very, very high-level overview. The problem is, we are counting on our, if we count on our CPU to cache certain operations and memory accesses that should have only been done while we have privilege mode, and we write a program that tries to access it that executes in unprivileged mode, there is the potential for us to do a particular attack on the cache and intercept the secret data we stored in the cache that should only be accessed from privilege mode while we are running unprivileged code. Very, very bad thing. Essentially, we just totally bypass privileged and let the user program access the privileged memory. Oops. Uh, and Intel has actually taken a huge performance hit to solve this particular problem, and Sparkle as well. Um, my understanding when I looked at this about six months ago was that current Intel CPUs were, they claim that it was only about a 3% hit to their performance to solve this vulnerability. But most of the specs that I've seen have been showing that it's closer to 26%. Uh, which is why the AMD thread rippers, which are not as susceptible to this particular bug, have been all the rage lately. It's because, uh, yeah, all of a sudden, since Intel's taking a hit, there's room for AMD to come in now. So when I bought my research machine, I thought, I, I bought a thread ripper. It was cheaper and it was faster. Why not? Anyways, I will post those papers. They're very, very interesting. All right, so the only way then that we can actually make kernel code run, because as a user program, uh, we don't even know the functions that the kernel has, is by causing an interrupt or an exception. 
Uh, remember that interrupts are things that are caused by hardware, and exceptions are things that are actually caused by software. So things like exceptions, sorry, we've already talked about interrupts. Uh, exceptions, that's things like dividing by zero. That throws an exception. Or an exception is also something like you tried to uh, access a region of memory that you do not have permission to do so. So for example, if you try to read or write null, exception. And how exceptions are treated is pretty much the same way that interrupts are treated. When the CPU receives that interrupt or exception, the CPU stops executing your code. And then the CPU is going to flip from unprivileged mode into privileged mode so that the kernel of the operating system can execute and actually investigate and handle it. After it's made the switch, we are going to execute the interrupt or exception handler, which produces the trap frame on the stack. And if you remember, the trap frame is storing every single register value, including the special ones, so that we can return to that exact point in the program's execution after we have handled this interrupt or exception. So we've switched from unprivileged to privileged mode, we have saved our trap frame, and now we can actually call and figure out which exception has been raised and call an appropriate handler for it. And that is how we're going to get the operating system to open a file for us. That's how we're going to get the operating system to write to the file or use printf, which by the way, printf is a system call. Malloc, not always a system call, but quite, I don't know what percentage of the time, a good deal of the time it is a system call. Lots of things are system calls. Yeah? So are these system calls really slow? And if you're doing them for like memory accesses and everything, isn't that like super, super, super slow? Yes. System calls are slow. They are very slow. Um, so one of the famous questions that I like to ask is if printf is a system call, and you can see obviously we have to switch privilege, we have to save our state, we have to call interrupt handlers and exception handlers and all of this stuff just to do a printf and put a character on the screen. The question is, is it faster to print the numbers from one to a million onto the screen as in a loop? Or is it faster to create an array or a character string of the numbers from one to a million and then do a single printf? One of them results in a million system calls. And the other one is probably just two. So when you are writing your code, you can actually now that you start thinking about how many of these operations are actually system calls. Can I minimize in my code the number of system calls that are happening? Because you could improve your performance quite a bit. So like when you do a RAM access and then you don't have access to that memory, um, your CPU has to like be safe when it's doing that. So does it like have to check every single memory access you do? Or like how does it handle that doing it? So the memory stuff we're going to talk about next week, that's virtual memory, um, which involves a special device on your CPU called the memory management unit, and it keeps track of some of this information. We're not going to get into that today. I don't want to be too confused. Um, so if this, is, I mean, if this is the only way, are there, I don't know, are there systems which kind of allow us to do common operations? without having to use this roundabout kind of exception way? <laughs> yeah, so I know an operating system that doesn't use system calls. Uh, Temple OS. Uh, Temple OS has no concept of privilege. Uh, the first versions of Windows and Mac, I'm not sure about Mac OS, but the very first version of DOS and Windows also had no privilege. And part of the reason behind that was because they didn't really see a reason to do it. And the other reason was, if you want to squeeze every ounce of performance out of what programs you are running, you don't do it. Um, and certainly there have been operating systems through history which have offered hybrid approaches. So some hardware was exposed to the user program, but not everything, and it was for a performance perspective. Today's general purpose operating systems, this is just a bad idea. 
just use the system calls. Let the operating system abstract things for you so that we can run them on whatever hardware, and it also helps with security. All right. So, interesting fact about the MIPS CPU you have uh, for this course is that MIPS does not distinguish between interrupts and exceptions. Uh, MIPS only has exceptions, but they have different types of exceptions. And if you were to look at all of the different types of exceptions, these are the major kinds of exceptions that our MIPS CPU has. And in particular, you will note that interrupts are actually an exception of type ESIRQ. Now, something you may note when you're playing around with any operating system is that interrupt is always short form to IRQ. I don't know why it's short form to IRQ, it just is. And it's been that way since I was a kid playing with Windows 3.1 interrupts. Um, that hasn't changed. So, exception type 0, that's actually going to be an interrupt. Now we have a variety of other kinds of exceptions. So stuff that you might encounter. How many of you have gotten a kernel panic in OS 161 due to a TLB miss? A few people have gotten it so far. If you haven't, when you start working on A2A, probably 75% of you are going to get it. Uh, and by the way, a guide to understanding that particular bug has been posted to Piazza. Uh, so that would actually be the address, uh, no, it's uh, at TLB miss on load and TLB miss on start. Those are exceptions. We also have uh, errors on load and errors on store, that is there's a problem with the actual address. Then we have uh, a breakpoint has been reached, we've got arithmetic overflow, but the exception type we care about right now is lovely number eight, yes. That is the system call exception. That is the exception that the system call library, which executes in unprivileged mode, needs to raise in order to force the kernel to execute some code. That's what we're going to use. So how do we do it? How do we actually cause this exception to be raised? There is a magic assembly instruction to do it, and it's called syscall. That's it. You say syscall. And an exception of type EX, this gets raised. But it's not that simple. Because how would I differentiate between I want to open a file, I want to close a file, I want to write to a file, I want to delete a file, I'm going to make a directory. How would I differentiate between all of the different system calls I actually want my operating system to do? Because there's only one exception that I can raise, and that's via the syscall. So we actually need more than just the ability to raise the exception. We actually need some mechanism to tell the operating system which system call we are actually requesting. So we need a way to pass parameters. And we can do that by taking advantage of the A0, A1, A2. I mean, sorry, those are the parameter registers. But we will use the parameter registers for the parameter store system call. And then register V0 is where we are going to put which system call we want. So if I want to fork a new process. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger, or more visible. So, to fork a new process, I want to call the fork system call. So, I can't just call this call because that just raises the system exception. I need to tell the operating system which system call. Fork has been assigned a unique identifying number. And in fact, every single system call that you can make has an identifying number. So into register v0, I load the system call code. To 
raise the exception. I use the instruction syscall. But this isn't enough. It's not enough. The fourth system call takes no parameters at all. But if I want to open a file, I actually have to tell the operating system the name of the file I want to open. Whether I'm opening it for read, whether I'm opening it for write, or both, or whether I want it to create a new file. We need to have some way of not just telling the operating system which system call we are asking for, but we also need to find a way to tell the operating system the parameters to that system call. And so we need to load into registers A0 through A3 the system call parameters. And if your function takes more than four parameters, then what we are going to do is put them in either the stack or the heap of the caller and put the address of the parameters into one of these registers here. When the exception gets raised and we switch to kernel privilege and we are executing the exception handler, we will first note, oh yes, this is a type syscall. And then we will call a system call handler. And the system call handler will look at the value stored in register B0 and say, oh yes, I see that you want fork. Or, oh yes, you would like to do open. And then we will look at the values stored in registers A0 through A3 to grab our parameters. All right. Now, obviously, in order for the user privilege system call library to make these system calls, it's going to need to know exactly what the call codes are for each and every single system call that could be made. We also need to share information about error codes that those system call functions could return and parameters that they take and in which registers the operating system is accepting those parameters. That information is not secret. It is a part of what we call the kernel's application binary interface, or ABI. And that is information that is not, it's not secret because we need the user land to know that information, and yet it actually tells us absolutely nothing about what's going on in the kernel. It's simply the kernel saying, here are the codes, here are the parameters I'm expecting, okay, go. We have it, it's what the kernel is doing is a complete black box other than that. So I would like to show you OS 161's kernel ABI. And I know it's in here in the notes, but that's no fun. So I'm going to switch over to a terminal. Let's make this nice and big here. Uh, let's go into the right directory. So if you are in the current directory of OS 161, go into include. And inside include, there's another kern directory, so you should be in kern include kern. This is the ABI for OS 161. And of particular interest to you is syscall.h. And uh, you're going to want to be using this on your next couple assignments. Because what you'll find in this particular file is the system call codes for every single system call that we can have. Now, you can add to it. Suppose you wanted to add system call functionality to the operating system. Obviously, you can add to it. Of particular note, though, you'll note the first few. Fork, there's the macro for it. It's system call code 0. Exec V is 2. Exit is 3. Wait PID is 4. And get PID is 5. Those are the five system calls that you are going to be implementing on the next two assignments. And there's the call codes. 
But other things that we have in here, we have ones for memory. We have ones for security, setting the user ID, getting the user ID, checking authentication, so on and so forth. Uh, killing a process and sending various signals. Uh, getting the resource limits, the usage amounts, all of those things are system calls. Every single one of them. Opening a file, piping, reading, writing, all system calls. Directories, changing directories, mounting a file system, timestamps, permissions. Sockets for networking and for IPC. Time, like clock, you know the time function in C? Guess what? That's a system call too. Rebooting, all of those. Those are all of the system calls. Now you might be thinking, oh, so OS161 has all of these features? No. Uh, almost none of them are implemented. <laughs> yeah. Another little secret. So if I wanted to create a new thread for my process, let's say I wanted to fork a thread in a user process, guess what? System call. OS161, by the way, does not support a user level thread fork. It is neither a system call code yet, nor is there an implementation. You can only fork a thread in OS161 in the kernel. You cannot do that in user mode. But if we wanted to, it would be a system call. Because if I'm forking a thread, I am changing the process structure. I'm adding a new thread to the process's thread array. I'm putting that thread into the ready queue, which means I'm playing with the kernel, which means I must be a system call. Going to sleep, to block on something, guess what? That's a system call too. Because if I'm going to sleep, I'm going on to a wake channel which means I am moving myself from running to some other place. I am yielding. I am getting all of that as system calls. And by the way, none of that is actually supported by OS 161 at all. Only in the kernel can we do that. Yeah? Yes. So the question is, do we switch back from privilege to unprivileged when we're done handling it? Yes, we do. We'll get to that. All right. So this is all of the system call codes. And something else you're going to find very useful for the next few assignments that is also part of the kernel's ABI is the error codes. Obviously, it is important that the kernel is able to communicate that a system call has failed back to the user program. For example, if I am running Windows uh, 3.1's file system, which is like FAT16 or FAT32, which we'll talk about another day, it only supports file names that are eight characters followed by a three-character extension. And if I download anything off of BitTorrent, I get like this long, garbled file name that's like 200 characters long. And if I try to save that on Windows 3.1 process system, it's not going to work. And the operating system needs to be able to return to me an error code that indicates this um, file name you gave me is the wrong size. And that is the part of the ABI. So in here, we have errorno.h. And uh, let's just go down here. These are the, all of the different error codes and their numbers and names that our operating system can return to user land. And you are going to find these useful. There are things like too many processes, or no such process, or I don't have a child process by that name, i.e. you try to call wait PID on someone who's not your child, then you should call or return eChild. Or if you try to create an address space and there is no memory for said address space, then you need to return magical error code enomem, which means there's no more memory for this operating system. So these are the error codes, and in the other file, uh, error message, we actually have the messages that would be printed. So this kernel ABI is going to tell you everything that the user program needs in order to raise these lovely system call exceptions and cause the kernel to actually execute code. All right, that's the wrong file.
All right, so we've gone over all of that information. So here is our path. In order to make any of these system calls run, we are going to be in our user application, and I want to um, write to the file. So I am going to call from the system call library, write. And write is going to set the system call code for write into register B0. It's going to load the parameters for write into registers A0 through A3. And then it raises the exception by calling syscall. When the exception is raised, we are going to automatically switch from unprivileged mode to privileged mode. And then my CPU is going to execute the exception handler, which the exception handler is going to immediately save to the trap frame the complete state of the program as it was. And then it means that, yes, it is saving with it registers B0 and A0 through A3, which store all of the parameter information that we need for the kernel is now saved in the trap frame, that'll come in handy. And now I realize, oh yes, I see this exception is a type syscall. I will call the system call exception handler for you. And then the system call exception handler will say, well, what exception did you want me to do? And it says, oh, I see that you have passed me the right syscall code through V0. All right, well, I will grab the parameters then from registers A0 through A3, which are in the track frame that we're going to pass along. And then we will call the kernel's implementation of write. The kernel is then going to be responsible for doing the work and then setting up the return values. Now, how do the return values get set up? We haven't actually said this. The return values, well, it's actually going to return not one, but two things. And it must return two things. The reason why we have to return two things is because how do I know whether the return value is an error code or a valid return value? So I need to return in one register success or fail, and in the other rest of the register, if success, I will store the return value, and if fail, I will store the error code. Now what registers am I going to put them in? We are going to put those in, I can never remember which ones because there's so many registers that we use. I believe, however, it is in register V0. We are going to put the uh, success or fail and then I think it's A3. That no, success or fail goes in A3, and return value or error code goes in V0. I always get it backwards. All right. So then, after the kernel has set up the return values and the success or fail return, we are going to then return from handling the exception to the exception handler. The exception handler will then restore the trap frame to the CPU. And then just before we switch back to running the user program, we switch from privilege mode back to unprivileged mode. We go back, we return to the system call library, who returns, who may take the return value from the kernel, format it, and then send it back to our user program. All of that happens every single time you make a system call. You want to make your code run faster? Reduce the number of system calls. It's a lot harder than you think because most of the tasks that you do involve system calls. Yeah? So when the exception handler or exception handler is sort of the trap frame, frame, doesn't it overwrite the return values that the kernel can register? Or does it like modify the stack? Ah, so when we, uh, the kernel is going to pass the return value back to the user program by modifying the trap frame. And then that will put that into those two specific registers. And we know it's safe to do that because we were already using B0 and A0 through A3 to send the data to the kernel. So it's safe to overwrite them to send it back. But we don't touch the other ones. Yes? So I was under the impression that like the error number, like A and C, is not the case, even though we're describing the correct overwriting the cracks and 
makes it sound like it is Quest Which like, program? Like in C, I think it's a global matchup called like Terror, E R R N or something. Yeah. And that's not supposed to be Quest State. But then, like, that's the system call thing returned by the journal, I assume. And you're saying that people write the path frame, which would make it probably Quest State. So, like, can I misunderstand you? I'm not quite sure what you're talking about. Maybe talk to me after class. Sure. Yeah. I don't, unfortunately, have the CC memorized. <laughs> but we can talk afterwards. All right. So, we've actually been lying to you. Welcome to your education at university. Everything you've ever learned in this course, we lie. And then in the next course, we tell you that we lied to you and tell you a better version of the truth, and then in the next course you take, you know, we told you we lied to you before, yeah, 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 we, we're just continuing on with the trend. What's the current lie that we've told you? We've told you that every thread has its own stack. That was a lie. Every thread has two stacks. Not one, every thread has two stacks. Here's the problem. Let's suppose that every thread had one stack. Then when I switch into kernel privilege mode and I start handling exceptions, the stack that I would be using because I haven't switched threads is that user threads stack. So now you're telling me that I have privileged kernel data on a user program's stack. Doesn't that sound like a really, really bad idea? that I might accidentally leak information into my user program from the kernel? We don't want to do that. Here's another problem. What if the user program came within four bytes of overflowing their stack, but never actually overflowed it on their own? They executed perfectly fine with no problem, but they came within four bytes of the max stack size. And then they throw an exception. And now the kernel is going to start storing all of its stack frames on that. But wait, there's only four bytes. So the kernel just overflowed the user's stack, and the user program has to pay for it by dying. Does that make sense? It doesn't make any sense at all. So actually, in order to handle this, every thread has two stacks, a user stack and a kernel stack. And the stack diagrams you've been drawing so far are, technically speaking, the kernel stacks. The only thing that goes on the user stack, only thing, is the user application stack. The trap frame, the switch frame, are kernel code. They should only go on the kernel stack for that thread. So, now, when the exception gets raised, we switch from unprivileged mode to privileged mode, but before we save the trap frame, we must also change the stack pointer from pointing at the user stack to the kernel stack. And then we go about our business as normal. Well. All right. Now, instead of walking you through a bunch of text on a slide, how about I actually show you this code, right? Because you're going to be playing around with it very shortly. So, how does this actually go down in OS 161? So, we're going to go back up to the current directory, and I'd like to direct your attention towards the arch directory. So, if we go into arch, and then MIPS, low core, that's where I want to be, you will see a file, exception-mix1.s. .s means I'm an assembly file. This is where the high-level exception handler lives. That is going to do the switch from the unprivileged stack to the privileged stack for that thread. It is responsible for producing and restoring the trap frame. So let's go into exception one next. And I'm going to look for a function called common exception. I really should remember what line number this is on. There it is. 
So this is common exception here. Common exception is the actual code that the CPU is going to execute when an exception is raised. Keep in mind that the privilege has already been switched. And now what the op this function is going to do is going to figure out, is the current stack I am using already a kernel stack or not? And if it's already a kernel stack, it means I am responding to an exception while I was already in kernel privilege mode. And so I don't need to do anything. But if my stack was a user stack, then I am switching from unprivileged to privileged mode. And I must find the kernel stack for this thread and switch to it. Now, how does it know where the kernel stack for the thread is? Draw your attention to kern include thread.h. Look at the thread structure, and you will see there is a pointer to a stack. That is not the user stack. That is the address of the kernel stack. So we do know what it is. So we're going to switch to using the kernel stack. And once we have done that, we are then, after a bunch of funny business don't worry about, we are going to actually save the trap frame. Here it is. There we go. We saved our trap frame. We are even going to uh, save the special registers here. And once we have saved all of our registers, we are going to call a function called mix trap. So common exception is responsible for switching to and from user and kernel stacks. And it's also responsible for creating the trap frame on the kernel stack and restoring the trap frame from the kernel stack. And it calls the function mix trap to figure out what kind of exception was raised. And that is not in this file. So let's leave this file and go into trap.c. And inside of trap.c, we're looking for a function called mipstrap. And what mipstrap is going to do is it is going to extract the exception code. And based on that exception code, it is going to call the appropriate handler for said exception. Now, one thing we haven't talked about, but it is important to mention at this point in time, is when the exception is raised, one of the first things that common exception does is disable interrupts on the CPU. When we are first trying to figure out what kind of exception has been raised, we disable exceptions on the CPU, which means before we need, we cannot be interrupted while we are still trying to figure out what just happened. So when we call mix trap, interrupts and exceptions are off for now. And if this was actually an interrupt, they stay off until the hardware has been handled. However, if it is not an interrupt, and we don't have to call main bus interrupt to handle whatever hardware thing has happened, then we are OK at this point with being interrupted again. So if it is not a hardware interrupt, then we turn interrupts and exceptions back on. So halfway through mix trap, it is entirely possible, so long as this was not an actual interrupt, we can have another exception happen. That's totally fine. Then we're going to check, after turning interrupts back on, we will check to see, is this some other kind of exception, like a system call. And if it's a system call, we are going to call this lovely function called syscall. And yes, I know this is getting confusing, because that's the assembly function, and that's a C function. Nobody ever said we're good at naming stuff, right? We have like four things that are a staff. <coughs> So if it's a system call, we take the trap frame, which saves all of the information we need to execute the system call, and we pass it into the system called dispatcher, which I'll open up here in a minute. If it's a memory error, we'll call this other one, and so on and so forth. So common exception is assembly for saving and restoring the trap frame, also for switching privilege and disabling interrupts. Mitstrap figures out which kind of exception it is and calls the appropriate specific handler. 
And if it's not a hardware interrupt, it will turn exceptions back on. And then for our system calls, we're going to go up a directory into kern arch mips syscall. And into syscall.c. And if we go in here, this is what we call the system call dispatcher. And from the trap frame that is passed to the system call dispatcher, we extract register v0, which is where my system call code is. And I have a great big old switch on the call number. If it is reboot, I call the kernel's implementation of reboot. If it is time, I call the kernel's implementation of time, and I pass to it parameters taken from the track frame, which store the registers A0 through A3. At the very bottom of syscall, I set up the return values. Let's go all the way down here. So if the system calls have returned an error, then I'm going to put in the track frames V0 error, and put the error code in uh, V0 and error in A3. And if it was successful, then in V0 I put the return value, and in A3 I put 0. In an operating system, we usually use 0 to indicate success and 1 to indicate failure. For example, uh, there's a reason why main should return 0. If you return something other than 0, it means that program terminated with a problem. Returning zero means I, ret I terminated with happy times. The very last thing that syscall dispatcher does, which may be a surprise to you, is it increments the program counter. Because if we do not do this, the system call exception will be raised over and over and over again. Because when the system call instruction was executed, the program counter didn't change because we were halting execution and doing something else. So we must manually tell it to go beyond the syscall instruction. Now why am I adding four instead of one? Because it's five bytes and we're moving it four bytes. So that is how things work in OS 161, and you are going to become intimately familiar with this over the next two assignments. You do not need to modify the assembly file. You do not need to touch MIPS track. For A to A and A to B, you do not touch those other two files. Syscall dispatcher and proc syscalls and proc.h are all you really need to touch. For A3, we need to make tiny changes. You will not write any assembly in this course for assignments, okay? So take a deep breath. You don't need to remember how to program in this. I mean, I hear you all whispering, yes, and I'm like, boo. I love writing assembly code. It's so much fun. I'm not being sarcastic. I really do like assembly. All right. One last thing, uh, just because we don't have multiple threads within a process doesn't mean we can't have multiple things running at the same time. We can have multiple processes running at the same time. You do this on your computer all the time. Uh, the last time I ran one and only one program was on my very first PC, which was from 1981. And the only thing I ran at that time was like, you ran the word processor, or you ran the video game. I couldn't write code and be on Stack Overflow at the same time. That wasn't possible. But it is through multiprocessing that you are able to copy off of GitHub into your assignment. <laughs> yes, I know about the hundreds and hundreds of solutions to our course's assignments available on GitHub. And by the way, we have them all. We do. I'm also aware that U of T uses ROS as well. Please don't look at their solutions on GitHub. They're really bad. <laughs> <laughs>
the end of this, we upload our own conversions Please don't. <laughs> uh, we actually maintain a list of everyone who has them publicly available, and we will send you a takedown notice. And at the moment, it's not going to impact you if you do, but I do know of courses who, in the past, if you have made your solution after the course is over publicly available and somebody cheats off of you, in other courses I've actually seen them give people who've graduated academic integrity infractions after graduation. Don't do it. We've never done it in this course yet, but I've seen it done. Yeah. They can revoke your degree. <laughs> All right, all right, all right. So, you can do multi-processing. Because keep in mind, it's not processes that run. Threads execute. A process has to have a thread in order to execute. So really, we're just talking about multi-threading here. Multiple threads and concurrency. So, what happens? We have a pool of threads. Now those threads may actually belong to different processes instead of all the same process. So if process A's thread is running uh, and a timer interrupt goes off, we will switch then we know from running in user mode, we will go into kernel mode. The kernel will say, hey, has my quantum expired? And if it hasn't, we go back to user mode. And that thread from the user process keeps going. And only when the quantum expires do we actually do a context switch from the thread of process A to the thread of process B. But it's the same idea. We're not, we're still doing context switches between thread, it's just those threads belong to different processes. But it's the same thing. All right, so I want to introduce to you very briefly in the next minute some stack diagrams. Because you better bet they're showing up on your exams. And this will give you a clear picture as to what's actually going on. So in our world, we have the kernel running in privileged mode and a bunch of processes, remember, they run in unprivileged mode. And let's suppose that we have one user process and it was going all about its business and decided it wanted to have a child, so it called fork. The nice thing about processes is you don't have to have two parents. You only need one. So you can do it all by yourself. So it calls fork. When we call fork, that is a system call library function. And it is going to result in zero being loaded into register v0 and then the system call being raised. Now, when that gets executed, of course, we are going to switch to privilege mode. We are going to switch from using the user stack to the kernel stack. And then we are going to execute our common exception to produce the trap frame. Where does the trap frame go? The kernel stack. Always the kernel stack. And then we are going to figure out which kind of exception it was raised by calling MIPS trap. MIPS trap will turn interrupts back on when it realizes this is a system call exception, and then it calls the syscall handler. And inside of there, we extract the contents of register v0, and we realize, oh, you want to call fork. And so we're going to execute sysfork. And because interrupts are on, guess what can happen? We can have a timer interrupt while we are executing this form. And I will leave that as a cliffhanger. We will finish covering this at the beginning of next class, along with covering assignment A to A.